with Amy Lee and Johnny Blair. Britain 
didn't deserve for its support of Israel. He began with an attack on one of his own housemates, Javid Nouri, whose conversion to Christianity had made him his first target. Christian Nouri is asleep in, in his own room, and then Alid has entered that room. There had been no animosity in the build-up to that. He took it upon himself to enter the room to cause Mr Nouri harm, purely because of his religious beliefs that Alid did not agree with. It was a violent attack. By the time police arrived, Alid had fled the house, thinking he'd successfully murdered Javid Nouri. In fact, he'd survived after extensive surgery. But the 45-year-old wanted more dead. A camera catching sight of him crossing the street with his knife raised, searching for his next victim. It was 5am by now, the road almost empty. Closer towards the town centre, 70-year-old grandfather Terence Carney was taking his regular early morning walk. CCTV captured him quietly crossing the street. Coming the other way, though, was Alec, who decided this old man, as he described him, would be next. The attack was brief. Alec's cries in Arabic of God is great rang out again. His victim staggered down the street and died here just metres from the town's police station. This, the moment armed police brought Alex's assault on Holly Paul to an end. The officers who apprehended him praised for their swift and safe containment of a suspect in circumstances this region's never seen before and for bringing him in alive. Incidents like this don't routinely take place in, in places like Hartlepool or in, in the North East in general. We see news stories coming back from London and places all around the world where you know we have uh, incidents of terrorist nature where the, the suspect is shot and killed. But we need to be seen to be bringing people to justice and we need to be seen that, that justice is served. The officers, the way that they acted, the way that they detained the offender without any further harm being caused um, was simply outstanding. As he was booked in for questioning, Alid shockingly and unapologetically once again made his intentions clear. This so-called moan operator, who even attacked officers during his interview, viewed as part of a rising threat that's hard to identify and even harder to stop. A lone operator operates in isolation. They are solitary in nature, so which even makes it difficult for you to counter because they don't speak to people about it, and it could be spontaneous, meaning you wouldn't be made aware of when they're going to attack. There comes a point where if they're no longer able to curtail that grievances that they have, that they might lash out in different forms, so some could result to stabbing, mass shootings, for example. And it told your officers he wanted to kill more, he said if he could have gotten hold of a machine gun, he would have killed even more. Do you believe that? I do, very much. Ali did not have the tolerance to uh, to accept the, 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 the religious views, uh, and that galvanised again his extremist mindset that it was his views were the right ones. Ali was hell-bent on causing harm that day. Had we not stopped him, we would have had far more fatalities in Halipo and in Greece. But Ahmed Ali's violent rage here didn't just end in bloodshed and the loss of an innocent passing stranger's life. It also blew open tensions in this town about who should be made welcome here. A bigger issue was raised today by Jill Mortimer. She's been the Member of Parliament, Conservative Member of Parliament for Hartlepool since 2021. And here she was standing up today in the House of Commons at Prime Minister's Questions. Every week my office is besieged by asylum seekers. My staff are intimidated by young men. The fact is most of them are illegal migrants who should be expelled. Enough is enough. I want these people out of Hartlepool now. There are those on social media and beyond who firmly agreed with their MP, but the remarks were also met with condemnation by charities, church groups, mosques, councillors and other civic figures who called for the community to come together. Amjit Kazir 
lives locally and has worked around the world on projects to tackle radicalisation. His greatest fear now that one man's actions that started at this property could prompt harmful division and leave a dangerous legacy for people who arrive here desperate for help. This is a, a terrible situation that happened here and our thoughts go out to the victim's family. But we've had a substantial increase in racism uh, in the North East, recorded, you know, from post-Brexit uh, on the back of COVID. My message to the to the wider community would be that communities that are coming here to live and work and survive alongside aren't that dissimilar from you. So we can't allow instances like this to further divide us, to polarise us, and to create that community tension where situations like this might arise again. As the man who brought terror to these streets is jailed for life, Harvey called now, left with a choice on how it should respond to stop anything like that night from happening here again. And we can rejoin our correspondent, Gregory Steele, now. So, Greg, have we had any response then from Hartlepool's MP about her comments at the time? No, I mean, no further comments this evening from Jill Morgan's office, but perhaps the last word on this case rightly belongs to the family of Terence Carney, a man described in court as an innocent passing stranger who loved to walk and who died on a walk in the most horrific circumstances. There was a statement read aloud from his wife. She said that she knew him as Tess and that since his death, she feels like she is numb and can't ever be happy again. The family made the decision not to release a photograph of him after he was murdered. It is a decision that robs his killer of that public trophy and effectively, you would hope, means that his image remains precious only to those who knew him best and loved him best. Of course, but not Greggy still. Thank you. Next tonight, to the police force which has secured 67% more charges for rape and sexual assault cases since introducing a new way of investigating sexual offences. Durham Constabulary has trained more than 300 officers as part of Operation Sotera, which aims to put the victim first while concentrating on the offender's behaviour. Our correspondent Chris Jepson joined the Home Secretary, James Cleverley, at one of the force's training sessions. A man cycles on his bike in Darlington last June. He's just sexually assaulted a woman in her home and is now following his next victim. Simple things like walking down the street, they've become tough for me. I find myself crossing the road when people come towards me or walking on the same side of the road. Just 15 minutes after dragging her behind the wall and sexually assaulting her, police locate him. Keep your hands where I can see them now. Now. Stand still now. Taken into custody, Michael Gallagher denies his crimes during police interview. Are you shaking your cold? Were you responsible for that offence today, Michael? No, no. Can you tell me why you were in the location you were around the time of this offence? No I deny that this is you who committed this offence. No problems. Jailed in September for 14 years, his victim now has sleepless nights. Every time I close my eyes, I can just see the man's eyes staring back at me. I've had to seek comfort by sleeping in the same bed as my mum. I mean, that was the only way I could feel safe. She's praised Durham Constabulary for the way they conducted the investigation. They were using new training techniques under Operation Soteria aimed at focusing on the behaviour of the offender rather than the victim. I think if you speak to, to victims and that wraparound support and the support they get from um, sexual violence advocates um, really make any difference. But what we are seeing, and it's not about the numbers, but being able to charge more cases and bring more offenders to justice is really making a difference. More than 300 detectives have been trained in Durham, and it's led to a 67% increase in sexual offence charges, something that's pleased the Home Secretary, who observed a Durham training session yesterday. I want to see those charge rates increase. I want to see the prosecution rates 
increase. I want to see more victims feel confident coming forward, knowing that they will be listened to, they will be dealt with professionally, and that the officers dealing with their cases know what they are doing. How important is this training, particularly when you think about how the reputation of police forces in the country has taken a hit when it comes to sexual offences over the last few years? Well, sadly, we have had a, a number of high-profile cases which have undermined the confidence in policing. In my experience, the people who are most angry about that are police officers themselves. This training helps to make sure that all police officers deal with these very sensitive crimes uh, professionally and sympathetically in a very victim-focused way. It is a real priority for me, and I want to make sure the UK is the safest place in the world for women and girls. Four and a half thousand officers nationwide have been trained in the new investigative technique, with more expected this year. Chris Jepson, ITD News, Durham. A man who bragged about delivering street justice has been found guilty of killing a Northumberland man. 28-year-old Jake McIntyre used a metal tyre lever to hit Andrew Peart on Stayford Lane in Guidepost in August last year. The court heard they had argued after Mr Peart walked out in front of the car McIntyre was driving. Mr Peart, seen here <laughs> arriving at hospital following the assault, died from a catastrophic brain injury. McIntyre of Stakeford Crescent in Ashington was cleared of murder but found guilty of manslaughter. A 65-year-old man has been cleared of murdering a retired teacher whose body was found in Northumberland. Peter Cosham was killed at his flat in Leith in August and his body was found near the village of Coat Welpington in September. Last year, Peter McNaughton pleaded guilty to murder. Today, a jury returned a not proven verdict for a charge of murder against 65-year-old Paul Black. However, he was found guilty of perverting the course of justice. Next tonight, and with the dust yet to settle on this year's Premier League season, the row over who can sell next year's Newcastle United kit. And Sports Direct, the company run by former Magpies owner Mike Ashley, has lost in a bid to overturn the club's decision not to let the retailer stock next season's strip. Well, let's join Tom Sheldrick, who's at the Court of Appeal for us. Tom, uh, a bit of a strange case, this one. Yes, Johnny, it is rather. What's happened is that Newcastle United have done an exclusive deal with the shopping chain JD Sports for them to sell next season's replica kit when it's released soon. But the rival retailer, Sports Direct, claimed that's an unlawful anti-competitive agreement. Sports Direct is, of course, owned by Mike Ashley, so he has been uh, in legal disputes with the football club he also owned until 2021. I wonder if he's still got those old shirts. Last month, Sports Direct's request for a temporary court order forcing Newcastle to supply them with the new kit was refused by a tribunal. And today, judges here at the Court of Appeal backed that up. They said the damage to Newcastle United will be far more fundamental if the injunction is wrongly granted than the damage that will be done to Sports Direct if it misses one or even two seasons supply. There is still the prospect of a full trial into this, but for now it appears that at least next season's Newcastle United kit will not be available to buy from Sports Direct stores. Neither the retailer nor the club has yet commented today. But one more line on Mike Ashley. Uh, the new Sunday Times Rich List says he's worth nearly £4 billion, and so he is the 49th richest person in the UK. Tom Live, thank you. Well, Chris Conway has joined us in the studio with tonight's sport. Chris, for better or for worse, it's the end of the road for three of the region's teams this weekend, isn't it? That's right, Amy, it is. Yes, final whistle will be blown right across the country. The Premier League closes its doors on Sunday, and for Newcastle United, there's the small matter of doing all they can to earn a place in Europe next season. 90 minutes isn't a long time in football, but it's now all Newcastle have got against Brentford on Sunday. Their European hopes hanging by a thread. It's not in our hands anymore, but ooh, we can only we have to deal with it. We can only control now our performance and our result against Brentford, and we have to do everything we can to do our part. Because what you don't want to do is the other teams to uh, make a mistake, and we're not there to capitalise on it. Slip-ups in their last two games means Newcastle's Euro dreams now rely on other teams. To finish sixth, Newcastle must beat Brentford, and they need Chelsea to lose. That would see the Magpies qualify for Europe. 
If they finish seventh by bettering Manchester United's results, they'll only qualify for Europe if Manchester City win the FA Cup. In a chock -a block injury hit season featuring brutal cup draws, supporters probably would have taken the race for Europe going to the last game. We've had the suspension for Sandro Tonali, Champions League for the first time, the scheduling, cup draws, refereeing decisions. I think Eddie Howe will learn from this year, and I also think he's got to as well. You know, for all of those things I've just listed, you can't just categorise them all as misfortunes. I think he is smart enough to learn from them, and I think we'll come back stronger. Next year, the big question is whether they do that in Europe or not. With so much of the talk of the past months about Newcastle qualifying for Europe again, will this season be a failure if the Magpies miss out? This has been a season where it could have been so much more. Um, and, yeah, th those moments will frustrate me, sure, for a long time. Eddie Howe might be frustrated, but ultimately it's been another memorable season. European trips saw the Geordie Army invade Milan, Paris and Dortmund. A weird time derby FA Cup win, and now the chance of European qualification again. Whatever the outcome in West London on Sunday, once the dust settles... You suspect Eddie Howe and his players will appreciate just what they have achieved against the odds. In other football news, we understand reports Middlesbrough boss Michael Carrick is close to signing a new contract are accurate. Both sides are happy to extend the relationship after Borough narrowly missed out on the championship playoffs, but the details are still being sorted out. Meanwhile, Sunderland released their retained list today. No real surprises, but it was confirmed that the Black Cats League One promotion-winning captain, Corey Evans, is leaving the club when his contract ends. It could be the dream finale for Newcastle Eagles women at the O2 Arena on Sunday. They've caused a major shock in British basketball circles by reaching the playoff final. But the fairy tale ending is still a long shot for Newcastle. They're up against the all-conquering London Lions, who've won all their domestic games this season and a European trophy. It's an amazing opportunity and... There's, we've got nothing to lose and everything to gain, so I think everybody is really excited. We're going to go. We've got such good chemistry on this team from everything we've been through this year. So we're just all in and all really excited. There, we're undefeated. We've won a few, lost a few, but there's still five players on the court. Five of them, five of us. We're all women. We all play the same game. So it's just about who wants it, who executes the best. And, you know, it's all God's time, and it's whatever's supposed to happen is going to happen. The Newcastle Falcons' miserable campaign ends tomorrow and they are desperate to avoid a place in Rugby Union's Hall of Shame. Unless they win at Gloucester, Newcastle will become the third team in Premiership history to go an entire league season without a win. The Falcons won't be relegated because the winners of the division below, Ealing Trailfinders, don't meet the requirements to play in the Premiership. But it's been a disaster, frankly, for Newcastle this season and only a win can improve the mood. That would just be a nice way to finish the year, like, especially for the lads. They've grafted hard all year. Like, as I said to you before, they've turned up week in, week out. They've never murmured. We've had long trips down to Exeter. We had a tough trip against Bristol the other week. So I would just love it for them more now. Else. So we get out there and just finish the season well. Get a good result. Get out there. Get a good result. Have a break and then come back fresh start in July. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Have a great weekend. And stay with us. The ITV Evening News continues at 6.30 with Charlie. Coming up in the ITV Evening News, a terrorist inspired by Gaza revenge has been jailed for life for the murder of a Hartlepool pensioner. Confirmed cases of the waterfall disease in South Devon double as experts warn that people may be feeling the impacts of the outbreak for two more weeks. And the Premier League title will be decided this weekend as either Manchester City or Arsenal emerge victorious. So join us for those stories and more from 6.30. Well, I've got to talk on the jet stream. Okay. UV levels, right. gorgeous loads of pictures of ducklings, goslings, and cygnets. What, what would you like? Right. Oh, and bear in mind, I cannot change it from here. Ducklings, oh, what a surprise, thank goodness. Okay, <laughs> let's take a look at some of the photos that have been sent in uh, over the last couple of weeks because it is that time of year. I don't have much to say about them other than R, I'll be honest. That's but um, need to say, I did a bit of research. Uh, Canada geese there. Uh, how many goslings do you think they have? Twelve? Five. Oh. How many goslings do swans have? 
three, none, they have signals, failed. Uh, uh, original is six. And uh, mallard ducks, how many quick counts? Eight. Yeah? Oh, hey! You've got one. That's a great way to start the weekend. Here's your forecast. Good visibility on the horizon. Tui sponsors ITV Time Tees Weather. Cloud amounts making a real difference to the weather at the moment. Where we've seen that sunshine, temperatures climbing up into the high teens, even the low 20s. A fresher feel under the cloud, particularly towards some coastal areas as we head through the weekend. Misty, murky conditions coming and going. But again, we will see those brighter breaks at times, and it is going to stay mostly dry. There's very little going on with the weather as we head through the next few days. High pressure is tending to dominate, keeping things calm. Wet weather, for the most part, being kept at bay. For us, though, we still have that feed coming in from the North Sea. It's not ideal for us. It does push in that threat, that sea mist, moving its way further inland. We're going to see that as we head through the late evening and overnight. For this evening, though, we do have those brighter breaks around at the moment. Then the cloud is starting to thicken, the murky conditions developing. We're going to see temperatures, though, holding up again in double figures, dropping down to around 10 or 11 degrees. So similar to what we've seen over the last few nights. First thing tomorrow morning, a bit of a dreary start for some. The clouds thick enough for a little bit of light and patchy rain potentially, but generally dry. And again, we're going to see those sunny spells developing, certainly as we head into the afternoon. So a bit of a breeze coming in from the North Sea. Again, that risk of some low clouds coming and going, but still temperatures around 14 or 15 degrees. Of course, again, it's inland. We're seeing those top temperatures of around 21, so still well above the average for the time of year. As we head through Saturday and into Sunday with high pressure nearby, little in the way of change. You can see that feed though there coming in from the North Sea once again. Again, a murky start Sunday morning, burning its way back towards the coast as we head through the day. We'll see that pattern through the next few days, but in the sunshine, we're still looking at highs of around 19 or 20 degrees. Tui sponsors ITV Timepiece Weather. We are still waiting for the grass pollen season to properly kick in. There's still a bit of oak and ash pollen around at the moment, but generally, as we head through the weekend into the start of next week, those pollen levels will stay low. Thank you, Ross. In just a moment, the national and the international news. I'll be back with an update for you at 10.30, but for now, from all the team here, thank you for your company, and uh, goodbye. Bye-bye.